Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to speak to Bill C-30, the Budget Implementation Act. Uh, the problem with Budget 2021 is that it is focused more on the political fortunes of the Liberal Party than on rebuilding the economy post-pandemic. Now, that's not just me, the Conservative member for Langley Aldergrove speaking. The former clerk of the Privy Council, Kevin Lynch, is quoted as saying this about Budget 2021. He notes that it is an intergenerational transfer of debt and risk that is unprecedented. Mr. Lynch goes on to state this about the Budget 2020, 2021. As a political statement, it should yield electoral dividends. As an economic statement, it favors short-term consumption over private sector investment. It sprinkles dividends initiatives far and wide. It adds heavily to the federal debt and misses an urgent opportunity to rebuild our longer-term growth post-pandemic. He is not happy with it. However, look who's smiling. The left-leaning Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. They're smiling. Its senior economist, David Mc. Donald, advised the Minister of Finance, to, quote, ignore ongoing and needless concern about federal interest payments. Those pesky debt servicing costs take all the fun out of the party. Let's just all agree that the budget will balance itself. Now, that is modern monetary theory at work, and we shouldn't be surprised coming from the left-leaning center for Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Modern monetary theory says this, the debt and the deficit do not matter. Why do we even keep track of them? It just doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is inflation. And as long as we keep inflation under control, everything is going to be good and fine. Now, the proponents of modern monetary theory will tell us that inflation is under control. It is more or less within the Bank of Canada's range of target range of 2 percent. Now, there's just recently has gone up a bit, and I'm happy to hear that member, a member opposite is acknowledging that at least there is a difference of opinion whether inflation is just a blip or whether it is long-term and deeply embedded. But let's hear what ordinary Canadians say about inflation. So talking to many small businesses in my riding of Langley Aldergrove, I'm hearing that there are that they are having to compete to get good workers to come back to work. They are competing with each other, which of course is a good thing, but they feel they are also competing with the federal government. Uh, they are being told, well, maybe you just need to pay your employees more if you want them to come back to work. That, to them, sounds like wage inflation. Talk to the young family, and there are many of them in my riding of Langley Aldergrove who are struggling to buy a house. There's a there's a housing, a housing affordability crisis going on, and that's not unique to my riding of Langley Aldergrove, although British Columbia's lower mainland seems to be ground zero for this housing affordability crisis. Let's take a hypothetical family that a year ago, let's say 15 months ago at the start of the pandemic, decided that they would take one more year to save up a down payment so that they could buy their first home. Well, that family today is somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 further behind. The goalposts have just been moved further. No matter how hard they kick the ball, no matter how well they play the game, they are not keeping up. They're losing ground. Tell them there's no inflation. They're not going to believe you. Talk to the to contractors who are working in the housing industry and in construction. Tell them that there's no inflation. And they will tell you about increased prices for lumber, for plywood, for steel, for concrete, anything. Any products related to construction, prices are going up. Tell them there's no inflation. They're not going to believe you. Now, here's one thing that we can agree on, I believe, with the Liberals and with other people in this House, and that is that the solution to fight inflation is to grow the economy. Make sure that the economy is producing the goods and services in sufficient 
quantity to meet the demand of the buying public. That's the solution. Unfortunately, this budget does not do that. It misses the mark. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has noted that a significant amount of the Liberal spending in this budget will not stimulate jobs, nor will it create economic growth. This is a budget that focus on, focuses on redistribution of wealth, borrowing money, quantitative easing. It does not encourage private investment. Now, we've heard on numerous occasions from the members that opposite that even during the Harper years, conservative governments engaged in deficit spending. Well, I would say, of course. In a time of crisis, that is exactly what a central government needs to do. It has two tools available to it, debt financing, quantitative easing, tax incentives to encourage further investment, and even printing money. These are all tools that are available to a central government, must be employed by the central government during a time of economic crisis to ensure that there is liquidity in the marketplace. We all agree on that. Where we disagree is when, we, when the central government needs to step on the gas and when to ease up, when to pump liquidity into the marketplace and when to step aside to let private enterprise take over. Now, don't forget that this Liberal government, even during good times, the first four years of their mandate, did not balance the budget. Full employment, good government revenues, economic growth, and yet it was deficit, one deficit budget after the other. I don't think Canadians have the confidence in this government to be able to see us through this crisis. The Conservatives, on the other hand, have a great track record of managing Canada's economy during a time of economic crisis, the most recent being the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, when Canada came out stronger than any other G7 countries. And today's Conservatives stand ready, willing, and able to take the lead again to do the hard work to get our economy back on track. Liberals focus, focus on Ottawa-centric policies. We focus on private investment. Now, talking about government-centered programs, I want to talk briefly about the latest iteration of the $10 a day universal child care proposal that's been put forward in this budget. Once again, as it has been put forward many times over many years. Now, to quote from a recent study report by Cardis, a think tank, this is what they say about the national child care proposal. The norms of modern work, particularly that of modern working mothers, will be poorly addressed by a nationwide system rooted, as it is, in proposals that were first advanced in the 1970s. Now, Madam Speaker, there's, if there's one thing that we learned about Canada and Canadians during this COVID crisis, it is that they are resilient, they are creative, they are inventive and they, they engage in entrepreneurial problem solving. We've seen a lot of Canadian families that have taken the opportunity of this COVID crisis to move out of urban centers into more rural, uh, urban, uh, suburban centers to get a bigger house for the kids, a bigger house, maybe a home office, maybe two home offices, one for mom, one for dad, maybe even a third one for the kids if they want to work, uh, do their school work from home. Ask these families what they think about a centralized, Ottawa knows best, daycare, child, uh, national child care um, uh, policy. Ask them what they want. Here's a couple of suggestions that I have. Three good ideas that the, I hope that the Liberals will accept. Number one, take the billions of dollars that they were planning to spend on national child care, give it directly to, the fam uh, to families. Let them do what they see best. Number two, let's create more housing by encouraging provincial governments and municipalities to increase supply. Rather than tinker with demand, let's increase supply. And number three, do something about rural broadband so that we can all work efficiently from home. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The honourable member for Humber River Black Creek. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and um, to my honourable colleague, um, I could have had my screen off and I still would have known 
that the individual speaking was speaking from uh, a conservative menta mentality, clearly uh, with the thought process. I guess I have to wonder what would they have done? What would the Conservative Party have done for the thousands and thousands of people that would have ended up unemployed or are unemployed as a result of this pandemic? And talking about childcare and women, we have a huge labor shortage in Canada and we have thousands of women that would love to go to work but don't have adequate uh, child care. What would I like to ask my honorable colleague what he would propose if he was, if their government was in charge? During this pandemic. The honorable member for Langley, Aldergrove. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I would like to thank the honorable member for that question. Uh, I pointed out in my uh, earlier talking points that uh, the Conservative Party agrees that a federal government needs to step in during a time of crisis. Uh, deficit spending, yes. Quantitative easing, yes. Pumping liquidity into the marketplace to keep the economy going and to support families, to support workers, to support businesses. We actually voted in favor of those programs when they were presented by the, by the Liberal government. We worked on improving them. They are better because of the work that we have done. Thank you. Questions and commentaires.